Hi, this is Colin Clark at Inter Breaking Defense here in the Raytheon Chalet where they've got a lot of the really cool stuff, including hypersonics. And I'm here with uh, John Beach Wilcox uh, from Northrop Grumman, who uh, have just announced that they're teaming with Raytheon on what sound like some pretty remarkable hypersonic advances. Yes, One of which is additive manufacturing, which a lot of us call 3D printing because it sounds easier, right? Mm -hmm. um, so how in the name of heaven did you figure out 3D printing of the combustor of something that burns this hot? Right. So it's really critical that we take advanced materials and understand how they flow into the additive manufacturing machines and process. And what's very interesting about the combustor and the engine of a scramjet engine is they have cooling ducts in them too. And so to be able to 3D print into the scramjet engine and the combustor, the cooling pass is very difficult. And we've been able to do that. And so we've, we can actually produce up to five by five by five foot cute parts in those dimensions in the additive manufacturing process. There is some welding involved, but we're trying and we're actually achieving the complete engine being developed through additive manufacturing. And you can't tell us what the materials are that you're No, sir, they're advanced materials, and a lot of them are hybrids of advanced materials, but the whole objective is to keep the cost down in materials to be able to do this at the Mach 5, the Mach 6, the Mach 7 speeds that a scramjet engine would go at, and to be able to do the full aerostructure in 3D manufacturing, which we're working with Raytheon on. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't too long ago that people were amazed when they were able to build hot sections of jet engines 3D printing, exactly. let alone something this hot. Right. Um, so, what does Northrop bring to this teaming in particular? Yeah. So the exciting thing that, that we're, we're excited because we've been teamed actually with Raytheon for five years to prototype a hypersonic cruise missile. And with DARPA and AFRL, we've teamed in a program called the Hypersonic Air Breathing Weapon Concept, where we actually are in the very near term then doing, going to demo a cruise missile at hypersonic speeds. So to be able to do that with Raytheon, who we've worked for as a long time as a partner and supplying Raytheon all the way to fuses and warheads and propulsion, we're very excited about that. Uh, this is uh, actually an advent in aviation because uh, a lot of the boost glide weapons have flown and they are flying right now and it's I, I consider it a less challenging technology as scramjet engines and to be able to go out there with a scramjet engine and produce a cruise missile that's much smaller can be taken to the battlefield in higher capacity air launch sea launch surface launch whatever we do with it I think is a tremendous capability for the warfighter. This is uh, Tom Bussing who's uh, VP of most of the most advanced weapons research that Raytheon does. Most of what he does, he can't tell us about, right? That is true. So, but you are going to tell us something about the new work that you guys, well, not new, but the accomplished work you've done to get a cruise missile size hypersonic vehicle that can fly in swarms? There, there have been many, many innovations to have made this possible. Obviously, our partner Northrop was involved in many of those innovations. There are unique materials that our vehicles are built out of. There are unique guidance computers that are part of the vehicle itself. There's a unique inlet system that's required to basically take the air, compress it, and, and allow it to then burn with fuel and generate thrust. So there are many things that have made this particular concept uh, viable. There's been a lot of ground testing, both direct connect and free jet testing of various parts of the, of the vehicle to get it to where it is today. Give, give our readers, especially uh, uh, senior uh, people in the Pentagon, people on Capitol Hill, an idea of how this can be used as best you understand it at right. this point. And I know you haven't flown yet. Right. So, the, so these missiles can be both air launched and ground launched. So they can be launched against a variety of targets depending upon what our customers choose to do with them. They can carry a variety of payloads, they can carry sensors, and they can be used in a variety of ways against, again, against targets that our customers might envision using them against. And earlier you were talking actually about uh, hypersonic swarms with the missiles communicating right. with each other, yes? You can envision if they, had, if they had the ability to communicate, if they had data links and were able to communicate, one could imagine if our customers again chose to do that, you could imagine uh, swarms of these things fl flying, against, uh, uh, flying against targets. Hmm. Well, uh, there you have it. The idea of maybe a dozen hypersonic cruise missiles headed towards a target, perhaps from 
various locations around the globe, all of them able to communicate with each other, self-correct, and find the target. Uh, how, would you, how would you characterize this uh, in terms of magnitude of, of all the developments that have come together? come together? So we have another program, the Coyote program, for example, which is a small UAS. We've demonstrated swarms of 30 of those mm -hmm. flying in formation and carrying out various missions. So that, that technology can be, extra, can, be ex, can be extended to a variety of, of, of platforms. So and how, how important do you think it is to the warfighter to have this next jump in capability? capability. Well, again, I have to leave it to the warfighter to decide how they would implement it, mm -hmm. but it, it certainly provides them with an additional capability that they currently don't have. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.